Good morning, everybody. This is Clayton. Uh, I'm an application engineer for the company in the uh, St. Louis region. I plan on showing you some tips and tricks with Inventor Cam today. Uh, if you have not seen the Cam package in Inventor, uh, it'll definitely be worth watching. If you're currently using Inventor Cam, I hope you pick up some nice tips and tricks that can let you work smarter instead of harder. Uh, again, just a collection of tidbits that we put together. If you guys have any questions, let me get this PowerPoint going. I am running this single-handedly, so I don't have somebody with me today answering questions. However, at the end of my presentation, I'm allowing plenty of time to take care of some Q&A. Uh, inside your web meeting panel, there is a Q&A section. Should give you a window that you can type your questions in. They'll show up on my screen. And obviously, when I'm done with my dem demonstration and presentation today, I will try to answer your questions. Uh, hopefully, they'll be related to the topics that I'm covering. Uh, if not, I'll try to answer them anyway. Anyway, uh, again, you can put your questions in at any time. I'm just not going to have a chance to answer them until I'm finished. So, with all that being said, our objectives today or to look at several things in the program. Uh, puncher selection. I've realized through doing training and through other support purposes that people are not fully aware, aware of all the ways you can select contours and shapes inside the program. So as I go through the presentation today, I hope you're going to pick up some tips and tricks on, on how to select things. Uh, I'm also going to go through some containment boundaries. Uh, Really controlling your tool path a lot of times is just about controlling your containment. Uh, keeping the tool from going into areas that you don't want to go into or keeping a tool in the area that you do want it to be in. So we're going to look at several different ways to set up some containment boundaries. Uh, we're also going to talk, talk about touch and avoid surfaces. Uh, primarily touch surfaces, but it's also primarily used as avoid surfaces. Uh, we're going to take a look at some patterns, mirrored patterns linear patterns, circular patterns, duplication patterns. So if they don't really follow a particular pattern, you can still do patterns. Uh, all these items are going to save you some programming time when it comes to programming with HSM and Inventor Cam. Uh, I do have another bonus topic I did not put on this slide. Just in case we run out of time, I won't get to it, but I think I'm going to have plenty of time. I've got another bonus topic on top of that that hopefully you'll all find beneficial. So with that being said, the first topic on the list is contour selection. How to select your contours and how to, how to basically use the selection tools available in the software to make it easier to pick and click contours and what you're trying to machine. So with that being said, I'm going to go straight in and show some product, then I'll do a little review slide at the end. So jumping right over to the product. I've got a part on the screen. I'll show it from different views here. If you look at it, it's got a high area, a low area, or an intermediate area, an area underneath. But there's nothing that actually goes around the entire shape as a whole. So just to give an example. If you're trying to machine just the outside shape of this part, you might go into like a, do a 2D contour or 2D profile. I click the tool. Uh, I've got a tool selected. It's right there in the middle of the screen. And you might start saying, okay, I want to go around the outside of this part. Well, if you click right here, yeah, you've got a good start on the outside of the part. Well, if I try to continue on around, of course, I could do all four of these fingers. But by selecting all four of those independent ears that stick out, when I go ahead and accept this, the resulting toolpath is just going to cut those four ears. You're not going to get a full profile around the part. But honestly, if I'm trying to clear the stock out of the way, I want to do a full profile. I don't just want to machine the four ears. So how do we go about doing that? Uh, let me undo that real quick. I could come in here and say, okay, let's do a contour. And maybe I should pick it up here at the top. Well, if you grab the top of it, that gives you contour around the top, but not necessarily the four ears. 
So let's say if we do the top and the four years, you know, what do you get then? Well, if you just start randomly picking things around the part, yes, I've got the top. Yes, I've got the four years. But unfortunately, when you hit OK, your toolpath is going to be doing a random tidbit of everything. I just want one nice, clean little profile that goes around the part. And some parts is really easy to get that if you got an outside profile. Sometimes you get a part like this, it just doesn't work too well. So the point of this topic is to show you tools that you can use to make this happen. So example, the main topic here for part one, contour selections. So grab your tool like contour. If I touch one specific area, let's say I just focus on this ear right here. If I click on that, one time it selects it. That's what you guys are used to doing. Now, the hidden little gem is not a menu item. It's not anything else. It's a second click. So if I click it again, you actually get this little toolbar that pops up. Some of you may have stumbled in that in the past. Uh, if you haven't, again, real simple, contour, click once, you get that. Click again, you'll get the menu. Now on the menu, it's, it's real simple. You have a closed profile, which you can tell that it's, it's closed if you see the light blue on the screen. It's a closed profile. I can do an open profile, which is basically the same as what I was getting before. You have an accept, which basically you're accepting the contour you selected. You have a cancel the current contour, so if you decide to bail out, you can cancel at any time. And you also have a recycle bin here or a trash can that says, you know what, I've just messed up, just delete it. Okay. Well, what you do is you kind of use this tool to your benefit. Again, right now I'm showing an open profile. I can also have a closed profile. Now, what most people don't recognize, I do want a closed path. But I don't want to take the default route that it's giving me. What I want to do is direct it around where I want it to go. So basically, I'm going to choose that I want a closed profile. And then I'm just going to start selecting other pieces of geometry. Now, if I go back here and pick the second ear, you'll notice, let me rotate the screen here slightly, that it basically left this ear, jumped up across the top and down to grab this ear. Now, the rest of it, because it did involve the top, it thinks I want to finish out with the rest of the top profile. Well, I don't really want the top profile. So all I have to do is basically say I want this ear and this ear. So every place that the ears don't connect, it's following the rest of the part. Now, it looks kind of strange when you're looking at it in 3D here. But when I accept this, notice it gives me a nice, flat, complete perimeter profile. If I go to the top view and take a look at it, you can tell it even follows the curvature. It's not just doing a straight line connection. It knows that the part is there, so it's following that part around. That is how to use the contour selection tools. So when I say OK, the end result is, is my tool path is going to be one complete profile around the whole part. Of course, I can go in and change the depths and the heights and all that other. That's a different topic. But just showing you how to select around a weird part like this, it's very easily done. So just to give you an example, let me undo that. Go to the home view here. Uh, it doesn't really matter where you start with that process. Just give you an example. I can go to contour. And let's say I pick the upper contour, like this shape here. By default, I get the upper shape. If I click again, I get this menu. Move it over here so you can see it. I do want a closed profile. But all I have to do is come in and say, I'd like to add this ear down here. And you'll notice it takes it from the top down to that ear. I can pick the next ear. It does the same thing. The next ear. The next ear. So basically, by picking the top first and then the four ears, I've got that same profile. So whatever you start with, it really doesn't matter. Go to Contour, pick once, pick again, 
decide whether you want it open or closed. Usually your answer is going to be closed. And again, you can go from bottom to top, back to bottom, back to top, back to bottom. Basically, you just want to pick your way around to get the outline that you're looking for. Now, keys that are going to help you with this, I've got this on my PowerPoint coming up. You can also use your Alt key and Control key. Anytime you want to add geometry, which by the way, I've not been using the Alt key, but if you want to force it to add geometry, you can hold down the Alt key and you will be adding to your selection. If you hold down the Control key, you'll actually be removing selections. So if I were to hold down the Control key and pick something again, you could remove that section of toolpath. Well, this one's already completed as a bounded path. So the Alt key and Control key don't necessarily work with this, but it's also nice tools to know about as far as selection. Again, when you pull the trigger, you should have a nice clean toolpath going all the way around the part. So hopefully that'll clarify some selection methods. We'll just bring up my PowerPoint here real quick. Things to remember when you're doing contour selections. You double click or click twice. I probably should have worded that as click twice to activate it. Basically, you click once to get the initial profile. You click it again and it will activate this little menu. On this menu, you've got the close profile option, the open profile option, your accept checkbox, typical inventor green check. You've got a cancel and a delete. Alternate things you might remember as far as selecting things, which doesn't necessarily go with this. Alt key will let you add selections. Control key lets you remove selections. That's your tips and tricks for contour selections. So next on the list, containment boundaries. If you're not doing profiles, sometimes you're doing pocket mills, area mills, things like that. Containment boundaries come in very handy. So let's talk about containment boundaries for a second. Go back over to the program. We'll close this one out. We're done with it. We'll talk about containment. Now, on this one, I've got a 3D model. Uh, the toolpath I'm going to talk about is parallel, but this shows for a lot of different applications. But if I parallel lace this surface, I just used enough step over to where you can see it. I usually run things a little bit finer than this, but uh, I'm doing a parallel lace with a ball cutter. Out here on these outer surfaces, sure, it's going to machine fine. Start at the bottom, work your way up, or start at the top, work your way down. I usually start from the bottom up. But you'll notice when I get into this internal cavity, I've got some steep walls in here, like the wall I've got highlighted right there. It's so steep that with the step over that I'm using, you can tell it's going up quite a bit of elevation because of that steep wall. Well, the end result is if you're machining this with a ball cutter, that back wall is not going to look too good when it's finished. So what can we do about that? Well, I was going to show you a few things here. The first thing about containment is the tool itself. I just want to start by showing you what containment does. I can control exactly how much of this model I want to machine. So give me an example. I'll just edit this tool path. I can go to my containment. By default, it's basically looking at the model silhouette. Uh, you can change that. Say, I would like to look at either a bounding box or a selection. 99% of the time, I usually want to select something. So if I switch over to selection, it's going to have me choose a machining boundary. Well, one thing I might do is say, okay, let's just keep it in the outside framework. So if I come down here and click, see that profile that it gave me? Again, not what I wanted. Click again. You get your little handy little menu comes up for selection. I want a close contour, but I want it to go up the side. So just by making one additional pick, I told it not to do the bottom square, but to do the outside edge. Okay, you can also do multiples. If you want to also give an interior contour, I can do selection again and pick like an inside contour. 
So looking at it from the top, I'm basically telling it to do the slope and stay out of that inside pocket. So just say, okay, and again, the only thing I've changed here is selection. You can tell I've got a really nice toolpath that goes up the wall, and I don't have to worry about anything inside that pocket. Now, with that boundary selection, you do have a lot of choices. And I just want to go through, again, part of this presentation is to show you examples, but at the same time, I like to talk about all the possibilities you can run into. So with that being said, let me go back into parallel here and show you some of these options. You saw me basically grab the boundary selection. Selection, and I picked it. It's not too complicated to do. But there's different ways to contain the tool. There's actually three different ways here. The tool could be inside the boundary. So when I selected those boundaries, I can keep the tool 100% inside that boundary. The end result is, you can notice if I look at it from the top view, this would be the center line of the tool, so the edge of the tool would be out here. Obviously, keeping it inside this boundary is going to limit how much of that surface it can machine, not to mention it wouldn't be machining all of the surface. So not necessarily a good option in this case to keep it inside a boundary, but let's say this was the bottom of a pocket and you're trying to keep it off the side walls. Well, that would definitely keep it off the side walls. But on the outside, not necessarily the best advantage. So let me just edit that again. Instead of going inside, you can tell it to go outside the boundary. Now, outside the boundary is going to give me an interesting look. And you'll notice the toolpath actually goes half the tool completely outside the boundary. Now, that would definitely machine all the surfaces that I want. However, since I told it it's allowed to go outside the boundary, it's still trying to machine the rest of the part. So yes, it's dropping over the edge. It's actually doing this vertical sidewall. It's actually dropping over the fillet on the inside of this pocket. Not necessarily what I want, but it is an option, so I thought I'd show it to you. The most common approach with setting up boundaries is usually not inside or outside. It's tool center. So tool center is going to put it where the center of the tool goes straight to the boundary edge. So that makes the most sense. Now, if you'd like to cheat that a little bit, you can tell it to go to the center of the tool, and you can even add or subtract a little bit. Like I could say, you know what? Go 50 thousandths beyond the center of the tool. Just by adding another 50 thousandths to it, you'll notice that I'm just starting to get a little bit of curl over on the edge. I'm just starting to get a little bit of curl over on this inside radius. So basically, it's going 50 thousandths from here to here outside of that boundary. So again, if you're in the bottom of a pocket, you could leave a little bit of clearance just to guarantee that your tool's not going to touch a sidewall. If you're on the outside, sometimes I do want the tool to just go a little bit outside of that boundary just to make sure that I'm not actually going to miss any or have any unmachined surface area. Again, same tool, just different options. So we'll go back into edit. We'll set that back to zero. Now, there is an option here for contact point boundary and contact only. Those are also two options that are available, and I think it's easier to explain them with my PowerPoint, so I'll go back over to the PowerPoint real quick. When it comes to containment boundaries, things to remember. You're changing your machining boundary to a selectable thing. So instead of the default, I told it I wanted to do a selection. You simply make that selection. It can be one or more. I'm going to show you more examples of that as I go on today. Again, tool center on boundary, inside boundary or outside. The help file does show you nice little pictures of that. There's the inside version, the center version, the outside. And you can add an additional offset. The contact point boundary. Now, if you're on a slope, now my part happened to end on flat areas, but if you're on a slope area, the default here for contact point, if you tell it you want to use the center of the tool, 
that's what it's going to use as the center of the tool. Your tool contact may be off to the side of the center. And if that's the case, there's a little area down here that might not get machined. Okay? If you turn on your contact point boundary, you're basically telling it, forget the center line of the tool. Even though I'm telling you to keep the tool center on the boundary, temporarily forget that and focus more on the contact point of the ball. So now you'll see the center line actually shifts over, and it's going to be calling this the center line of the contact. So if you have a sloped area and you're worried about that contact area, you basically can say, you know what, look at the contact point boundary, and it will shift it. I will give you some warning here. Since your tool is going outside the boundary, if there's something else out here on the right, you could accidentally machine something you didn't intend to, so be careful with that one. Uh, contact only. If you happen to have any holes drilled through your part or void areas, as I call it, uh, contact only basically says if you're dropping into an area where there's nothing to machine, cut the tool path off. So I don't want the tool running across that hole. Just exit, come back down, you'll see your wrap it in and wrap it out down there. So again, that is usually on by default, so your end result's gonna look like the left. If you uncheck that, your tool path, instead of wrapping in and out, will just drift straight across the opening and pick up on the other side where it left off. Now, if it's a smaller hole, honestly, it's probably a little bit quicker, just keep your tool down. As you get into larger void areas, you may not want your tool to drift across that airspace. You'd rather get up, wrap it across and get back down on the other side. So hopefully as far as containment boundaries go, these are all your options. I tried to talk about everything that you see here so it all makes sense to you. And that's the point of this presentation is to give you the tips and tricks so you understand everything that's available to use. Uh, we talked about the selection, we talked about the containment options, we talked about the two options there plus your offset. So, touch surfaces. Another way of controlling exactly what you're machining and what you're not. I'm going to show a little bit of touch and containment at the same time here, because they do kind of overlap a little bit. But I wanted to clarify exactly what touch surfaces is all about. So speaking of touch surfaces, we'll take a quick look at that. Go back over to the product. So we're done with this example. And we will open up touch surfaces. Now, what I did here, uh, just to save time, I set up a parallel tool path with no options. I said, here's my part, run a parallel path on it, and be done with it. And this is what I've got. Now, if this is a mold or a cavity or something that you're working with, uh, nine times out of 10, I probably would have already cut these top surfaces with a flat end mill. Well, unfortunately, if you say, I want a parallel pass, here's the part, they give you everything, okay? So what can we do to prevent it from machining the top surfaces? One easy option, edit your tool path. We could basically do the boundary again. Instead of taking the part silhouette, change it to selection, and what I would like to select is this edge right here. Now, of course, typical program, what's it do? It gives you what it sees, the top profile. I don't want that. So again, I'm gonna click a second time. I do want a closed profile, just not the one that it's showing me. So all I have to do is give it a little guidance to tell it where I would like to go. So just by picking the arc on the back and the other edge across the other side, I now have a containment boundary go ahead and accept that so you can see it, it only covers the inside profile, the inside area. So that's simple. I just now contained it to inside of that area. So my flats are now machined with a flat cutter. Now, if you want to continue on with the containment, looking at this part, maybe it's not a really good idea that I have a ball cutter diving down into those pockets. I can contain that as well. 
edit the tool path, go back to my machining boundaries. I've already got the outside contained. All I have to do is say, I want to add the two circles. So just by adding the two circles and saying, okay, now I'm completely avoiding those two circles. Now here's a, probably a good example to show that crossover I was talking about a minute ago. Let me say edit, turn off that contact only. Yeah, it's still gonna jump across because it sees it as a larger area. Uh, da, 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 da. Edit, we'll leave that on. Okay, now let's say that the slot here in the middle, the slotted area here, maybe you're going to choose to do that with a different tool. Again, since you're setting up boundaries, you can do a ton of avoidance with boundaries. Uh, just to give you an example, a lot of people question this. Uh, I do this on support a lot of times. When you're talking about these boundaries, if you have pockets inside of an area basically it's going to machine the larger one and stay away from the smaller ones uh, sometimes they may overlap each other or when i say possibly get into conflict with each other so just give an example if i click to add another machining boundary and grab that slot notice it's really not inside or outside it's kind of like a new boundary uh, so how does it treat that? Basically, it's going to treat it just like an inside pocket. So there's one quick way to avoid the two round pockets at the bottom and the slot and the upper areas. Big difference from where I started, right? So with containments, I can control everything about the areas that I want to machine. Without containment, I'm basically back to where I started machining the whole thing. Now, that's one way of doing it. This topic was actually supposed to be about touch surfaces. So let's look at another option here. Let's say that I want to avoid that slot in there, but I'm gonna do it a different way. So example, let me go back in here. And it's a tool path. Okay, if I blow away all containments, it's machining the whole thing. Okay, so let's edit that. Let's put in a selection. Again, I wanna do, just like I did before, that inner area. Clear that. Selection. That. Click, there it is, close profile. I wanna add that and add that. So I want that while I'm picking. Whoops. Helps to pay attention to what I'm doing instead of just talking. Close profile, I want that and that, except I wanna add that and that. Okay, just wanted to make sure I was right back to where I started. This is where I was at just a few minutes ago. Now, about touch surfaces. By default, if you edit your toolpath, down here is your void slash touch surfaces. By activating that, I can tell it to avoid any surface on the model. So just by grabbing that avoid arrow, I can say avoid this slot. That one slot is all I want to avoid. When I say okay to this, you'll notice it's kind of like putting a containment boundary on it, but I didn't have to go through the whole containment boundary selection. I just said avoid that one surface. So anything you want to avoid, you can do it that way. I could have actually just told it to avoid the top two surfaces as well. But part of this demonstration is to show you the difference. If I edit this, Instead of doing an avoid, this can also be used as a touch. Now, I did not change my selection. I did not do anything other than just turn on touch surfaces. What touch surfaces does, because I only touched that one surface, 
that will machine just that one surface. So by default, that tool does an avoidance, but if you reverse it, it actually does a touch. So just give me an example here. Let me just delete this tool path. Okay. If I go to parallel and I grab my tool, I come over here, I take the silhouette, I can say, you know what, I just want to avoid that. It will basically machine everything but that one surface. If I reverse that and say, no, nope, that's his touch surface, then it's only going to machine that one slot. Again, I probably set the step over a little bit finer so you can see it. Okay. Now, you can do a lot of work with this. Uh, edit. Example. Some of the examples I showed you using containment boundaries. If I just clear these selections and say touch, I'd like to touch that surface and that surface. You'll notice I get the same results as I had earlier using boundaries, except where it dips into the bottom down here. So sometimes boundaries are going to work a little bit better than touch surfaces or vice versa. Uh, basically, that switch by default, is avoiding surfaces unless you tell it you'd rather touch those surfaces. So there's the machining of this part, avoiding those two surfaces that I touched. Uh, I, I call it a left or a right. You either want one side or the other. Uh, you really can't mix and do half and half of each. Uh, you have to decide whether you're touching what you want to machine or avoiding everything else. But it's a very powerful tool to machine virtually anything just by touching it. Okay, so hopefully I've showed you enough examples of that. Touch surfaces, things to remember. By default, anything you select, it is going to avoid machining those surfaces by default. Clearance. If you want to add or subtract any clearances to those touch surfaces, like I want to stay away from that sidewall, but stay five thousandths away from the sidewall, all you have to do is put in a little clearance value and it will add extra distance to those avoid surfaces. Now, if you turn on touch surfaces, it completely reverses everything. Completely inverts the machining of avoid surfaces, they are now all touch surfaces. So it's kind of like two tools built into one. You just have to pay attention whether you're avoiding or touching. Easy enough, right? Okay, patterns, mirrored patterns. Patterns are kind of fun. Uh, when you go into mirrored patterns, you can save a lot of machining time. Let me close this down. We will go into my mirrored patterns. Now this particular part, we use this in training a lot. I've got a face mill on this. I've got an adaptive pocket clear, a 2D contour around the, uh, there's a little chamfer around the top of this part. I've got a spot drill, a hole drill, and a counter bore. So I've got like several operations that I've done on one half of this part. Notice everything is occurring on the left side. Well, obviously the right side is just a mirror image of it. All you have to do is grab all the tool paths you want to consider. I'm holding down the control to do multiple selections. I'm grabbing everything but the face mount. So I can grab everything, right click, add to new pattern. In this case, I want a mirrored pattern. All I have to do is select a mirrored plane. Little hint here, if you don't have a plane visible on the screen, it's not a problem. You can go back to your model tab at any time, and I could dig out these origin planes or any other work plane that's in here. But I happen to have a plane in the middle of the part right there. I can select it right out of the model browser and then go back to cam and finish what I was doing. Now, your options here, 
keep the original toolpath. I do want to keep the originals because I want both sides. An operation order. Since I have five different operations, I can preserve the order, which basically says it's going to completely finish one side before it does the mirror. I can do order by tool. So if it's using one tool on the left, it will use the same tool on the right before it goes back and finish. Or you can order by operation. Uh, in this case, I'll just do order by operation. Since I've got five operations, it should do each one independently on both sides. So let me say OK to this, and you'll see the toolpath shows up. There's your pattern. There's your five things that are being patterned. Nice structure in the browser. But if I want to simulate this, show a little stock on this, you'll see the face mill come in. Speed that up a little bit. You notice it does the helical in. It's going to do the pocket on one side. Since I told it to order by operation, it's going to do that operation on the left. Then it's going to immediately come over and do that same operation on the right. So it is order by operation on both sides. So when it's done with this on the other side, it's going to go into my little chamfer mill. It's going to do a little chamfer on the left. Again, it's going to go over and do the same thing on the right. That's what it means by order of operation. So you minimize tool changes, and it's basically doing the mirror one piece at a time. If you leave it as is, it would completely finish the left pocket and then come over to the right pocket. Sometimes it makes more, more sense to not do the tool changes, catch both sides at the same time. So that is a mirrored pattern. Things to remember, all you have to do is change your pattern type to mirror right there. I usually keep the original. It's rare to mirror from one side to the other and not keep the original. That is the default. And consider the operation order. Either do it by preserving the initial order so all five tools are doing the same thing. Uh, order by operation, which is what I just showed you, order by tool. Okay, I did see one question that just popped up in the window. Uh, there is one thing that probably should note. If you're mirroring a toolpath, one thing you'll discover, and I, I will tell you I've worked in 10 different CAM programs. They all behave the same. If you're doing a climb cut on one side, it will turn into a conventional cut on the other side and vice versa. They do not completely reverse the toolpath on a mirror. I haven't seen a software yet that does that. Uh, but yes, it is very common that one side will be climb cut, the other side will be conventional, which makes it look like it's running in reverse order. Uh, this nature of the program, they all do that. I haven't seen one yet that does it. Maybe someday it'll show up, who knows. Uh, linear patterns. Now, linear patterns are not necessarily mirrored. Let's take a quick look at linear patterns. Let's close that one. Linear pattern. Linear pattern is just as easy. In this side, this pocket, I've got a little adaptive clear and I've got a contour. A low profile with a smaller cutter. So I've got both. I'm going to grab both tool paths, add to new pattern. This time, instead of mirror, I'm going to choose linear pattern. Linear pattern is pretty straightforward. You're going to choose a direction, direction one. Just grab anything straight on the part. If you have to make a sketch with a straight line in it, do that. I'm just going to grab this front edge. You give it a distance, mine are three inches apart, and you give it a count. There actually, I need three of them. So there is three patterns to the right. If you need an additional direction, just simply turn that on. The additional direction, just pick a, an, an alternate direction. It doesn't have to be perpendicular to the original, but it usually is. Uh, I'm just going to pick that edge right there. Again, set your distance. They're three inches apart. 
Now, you'll notice sometimes by picking a straight edge, it doesn't know whether you want to go down or up. Not a problem. Both of these have a flip option. So if you notice your toolpath is showing up below, just tell it to flip it, and it will show it up above. So again, it's kind of like doing an array pattern inside Inventor, is you just give a distance and count, distance and count. You pick two directions. Same options as before. Keep original, reverse. Now, by default, it will cut the original first, then the next two that you mirror, or next two that you're patterned, and then the next three after that. This will actually reverse the order to where it'll start machining on the far corner and come backwards. Uh, kind of a weird tool to have. I usually have an original I want to keep. So, again, you can order by tool or order it by operation. In this case, it would be the same thing. And that's what it looks like. So if you simulate that, you can see it goes in, machines the first one. I'm going to skip. I'm going to go into the second one. You can see I skip. I'm going to the third one. I'm going to skip. 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 And skip. And then it goes back to the second tool. Does the cleanup work. little bit limited on time so I'm not going to sit there and let that run forever but that is your linear pattern things to remember about that change your linear pattern your pattern type direction one is always there by default if you need two directions you can do the additional direction keeping the original that's the default you can reverse the order and you can also operation by tool or by operation or preserve uh circular patterns take a quick look at circular patterns open circular uh this is actually the part i had on the screen earlier i've got my contour around the outside of it i've got the pocket which is clearing out the top of one of those ears again rather than doing all four of them individually Real simple, right click, add to new pattern. This is going to be a circular pattern. All you have to do is pick a rotation axis. Now, I could go to the model page and pick my origin axis. I should have a Z axis down the middle of the part. I can do it that way, or I can just stay on the cam page and just pick anything around. By default, it goes 360 degrees times two. I want it times four, so I'm getting one every 90 degrees. So by default, it is equal spacing. It's going to take 360 divided by four. If you turn off equal spacing, you can control it by angle. I can say I want four every 20 degrees, or I want four every 45 degrees. You can kind of see what it's doing. Or I can say I want four every 90 degrees. That would do the same thing as equal spacing around 360. So again, different ways to do the math, pretty straightforward. You've got the same options as everything else. That gives you an idea of that. Again, quick simulate on the setup. That will machine the outside area. We'll just skip that real quick. And you can see on the revolve patterns that this is doing a climb cut. And the next one is also going to be doing the same climb cut. So you don't have reversals like you do with the mirror. Okay. So back to the PowerPoint. Circular patterns, uh, pretty straightforward. The type is going to be circular. I didn't show you the flip direction, but if you're going clockwise, you can also go counterclockwise. That's kind of irrelevant when you're doing a full circle. Uh, I showed you the angles and count. Same options as all the other patterns. But again, once you do one of these patterns, they all start to look the same. Then last one here, duplicate patterns, duplication patterns. I think this is what one of the students or one of my people are asking on the questions right now. Can each sub pattern use a different work point? 
I'm not sure I'm following that question, but maybe you can let me know after I show this section here. This is what they call duplication patterns. This one to me is the most powerful. Uh, if I go to open and grab pattern duplication, notice I just have one pocket here. It does have my adaptive machining and my contour inside there. This one I like. It does require that you have a sketch. I do have an unused sketch. It's got two work points in it. Actually, not even work points, two sketch points in it. So it's just a sketch. But just to give you an example, I've grabbed these two tool paths, add to new pattern. This is what they call a duplication pattern. It's not circular, it's not linear, it's not following a mirror, it's not doing any one of the other three. You basically grab a source point. So I'm gonna grab a source. I'm gonna grab this lower left corner of this H. That is my source. And then you just come in and you set up targets. I would like that point to repeat here and here. Again, you can keep the originals, do the reversals, same operation by orders. Uh, but when you say okay, you actually have, let me go to the transparent material. You actually have the same tool path in three locations. They're all gonna have the same depth. They're gonna have the same look, but it's basically designated by where you put this, shat, this sketch point. So if you change a sketch point, then tell it to generate new tool path, just that easy. They show up as a new point. Very effective way to do duplicates on a part that don't necessarily line up in a straight line or a circle. I just answered one of the questions they came in that says, can each one of these offsets have their own work coordinate system? Uh, the answer is yes, you just go into the post-process page and turn that on, and then you would add a work coordinate offset to each one. So basically you would have a G54, a G55, a G56. So yes, you can do that. Uh, back to the PowerPoint, duplication patterns, we have 10 minutes left, perfect. By default, I was going to end here. Uh, again, duplicates. You do need a sketch with work points. You select your source point, select your target points, options to keep the original or reverse, uh, same operations order. By default, this was going to be the end of my webinar, but we've got time, so I'm going to add a bonus for you guys. On the bonus, if any of you ever have a need to do a custom form tool, it's really not a bad process. It's a whole lot easier than other softwares that I've worked in. Uh, so we're gonna show you how to do a custom form tool to basically create any kind of form tool you want and put it into use. So with that being said, I've got about 10 minutes left. Go back to the product. All you have to do is say, I want a new inventor part. What you're going to do is basically draw the tool you're going to machine with. So it's kind of cool to do it this way. Um, if I go to create a sketch, this is catch number one. You do want to sketch on the XZ plane. Usually inventor doesn't care. In this case, you want to sketch on the XZ plane. We'll go up to the top view here. I'm going to spin this around. So they basically want the Z axis to be the center line of the tool. So you basically start drawing your tool. I'm going to go to a line command. I'm going to go to center line. And first thing I'm going to do is draw a four inch center line. Now, it doesn't have to be a center line, but it's recommended that you use a center line when you do revolves. 
So I'm going to go back and start drawing the rest of my tool. So I need my tool to have a shank. I'm going to come down here. I'm going to come out. Come down. Do a little zigzag here. So that's the shape of the tool that I want with a little bit of dimensioning. I need this to be an eighth of an inch. I need this to be an eighth of an inch. I am going to put fillets in this tool. That's kind of the whole point of this form tool. So I'm going to add a fillet here for an eighth of an inch. I'm going to put it between those two lines and those two lines. I do need some diameters from here to this inside edge. It's going to be an inch and a half. From there to there, it's going to be three quarter. And I do need an overall height on this. I'll just do a height from here to here. Put that in as 0.75. So basically, you're going to draw your tool. I'm going to do this the easy way. I'm just going to do vertical. I want that point to line up with the center point. So that's the shape of my form tool. Once you get it fully constrained, hit finish, go ahead and do a revolve. Uh, you can get a better idea of what that tool is going to look like. Take the default 360 degrees. You're just basically making a revolve solid. So that is my contoured tool. All you have to do is save that, put it somewhere where you can find it. I'll just call it demo tool here. Now all you have to do to start using it is to find the shape of machine. So let me open up another part here. That'll work. Okay, you'll notice this has a wall with a radius on top and bottom. That's basically the same dimensions I just used on that form tool. So with that being said, I'm just gonna do a contour. I'm gonna to go to my tool selection. And this is where you create a tool out of the part that you just made. It's a very simple process. There's only like four clicks to it. I'm just gonna say I want a new milling tool. When this comes up, right here under type, You've got all these different types to choose from. All you have to do is say, this is a form mill. When you grab form mill, you're going to do an import. And you're going to import that part file you just created. You can see the date and time stamp on that. It will show up. Now, depending on how you built it, sometimes it will show up right side up, and sometimes it will show up upside down. If it shows up with the head up, just flip it. You want it to be, you know, Z positive in the spindle. You don't want it like that. You do want it like this. All you have to do is once it's in here, technically I'm done at this point, but you want to pay attention to where the contact point is on the tool. By default, it's going to go always grab the lower left corner. I can set this contact point anywhere I want based on the diameter that I give it and the tip offset. So example, I had that dimension in my part where I told it it was an inch and a half diameter. That's to this inside wall. So if I put an inch and a half here, it moves this line to that inside wall. Now the tip offset, if I put in like, I don't remember if I put in 875, That's too high. I want it actually at the bottom of this filter. So it's going to be more at the 75 range. So you'll notice by changing this number and this number, I can put these crosshairs right at that bottom of that fillet. And I'll show you why I'm deciding where to put that contact point. Once you have this done, obviously I can go to shaft and change my shaft sizes. I could add a holder to it. I can set up all my feeds and speeds. So if you want to run this at a slower speed, you can. Uh, 40 inches a minute, let's just go 10 inches a minute. So you can set up all your feeds and speeds. You can go to your general page and put in the description.
You can put in a comment, a vendor, product ID, et cetera, et cetera. When you say okay to it, you just created a custom tool. Okay, once you select that tool to machine with, my contact point is that edge of the fillet right there. So basically, I just want to select this is my boundary. So you end up with your tool path. If I simulate this and hit play, let's do this without the stock. You notice that it just basically hugs that shape. Walks all the way around the part, just like it's supposed to. So it's very easy to create, establish, and start using a contour form mill. Uh, I was amazed at how easy that was to do when I first ran into it. And I thought that'd be a good quick tip to put in this demonstration. So. Custom form tools, We've done the demo. Again, things to remember, make sure you sketch on the XZ plane. You want the Z axis to be the center line of the tool. Uh, the shape you draw can be any shape you wanna draw. When you get in to actually start creating your tool, your brand new tool, these are the four boxes to pay attention to. You wanna designate it as a form mill. Make sure you set your units. I drew my part in inches, so it just came in as inches. Uh, but you can actually draw it in metric and tell it, tell it it's an inch tool and vice versa. Uh, you import the file, flip it as needed, and then you change that contact point by changing the diameter and the tip offset. So really, once you fill in this one page, you're done. Start machining with it. So hopefully that was good stuff to remember. Uh, looks like we pretty much used up my hour. So if anybody has any questions, I'll try to address them in the question window. I tried to do some of them as we went through. Uh, can a pattern be driven by a pattern in the model? I don't know for sure. I don't think it can. Um, let me check on that and send you an email back offline. And that's the only question that came in while I was talking. So I think the other ones were answered. If anybody else has any questions, feel free to let me know. Now's the time. All right. Well, I hope you were saw at least something in there that was worth your effort of watching the webinar today. Uh, I tried to throw enough in there in different areas that hopefully you saw something. I figure if you saw something that was beneficial, then your time was well spent. So again, you're going to see a survey come out after this webinar is closed. Uh, feel free to put your comments in there. If you did benefit from something, please let us know. That way we can build future content for future webinars.